Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Anchor. This is day number three. We're on a roll here. This is halfway today because we have 24 presentations, and uh, today we will do uh, four more, which will give us 12. We'll be halfway. Uh, today we are going to study some introductory matters, and then we're going to go uh, to study the first seal. So I'm hoping that in this session we will be able to uh, do the introductory matters and also the first seal. But if we are not able to finish the first seal, we'll do it the second session. But we want to begin with prayer, as we always do. So let's bow our heads, heads reverently for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of beginning this new day. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you because you give us life this day. Thank you for your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be present to give us understanding into the depths of this wonderful book, the book of Revelation. Uh, we place ourselves in your hands, pleading for your presence, and we thank you for being with us because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to page 111. I'm skipping a few things here that we've uh, basically covered uh, before, but uh, I want to deal with a subtitle, Ellen White and the Seven Seals, on page 111 of your syllabus. And I want to remind those who are um, watching the live stream and watching on our Sum TV channels that um, you are... Uh, you can also get a syllabus from us after the class ends, uh, or you can access it online, and uh, you can download it if you wish, but it'll be available after the class is over. Uh, so anyway, if you want a hard copy, you can contact us and uh, get information about how you can get a hard copy like the one that all the students have here. So let's go to the section, Ellen White and the Seven Seals. And I'm going to go through this carefully because it deals with some very important matters. At first sight, Ellen White has little to say about the first four seals and the seventh seal. In fact, as far as I know, she never quotes Revelation 8 verse 1, which is the seventh seal. However, don't be fooled. Though she does not have much to say in terms of quantity, she does have several qualitative statements that help us know when the seals are fulfilled in the course of history. Ellen White also has some significant statements besides uh, a statement on uh, the uh, first seal, the second seal, and the third seal, at least hints. She has uh, several statements on the fifth seal, and uh, she has many, many statements on the sixth seal. So um, it's very important for us to realize that Ellen White does have quite a bit to say about the seals, even though uh, many times she doesn't quote the verses, she is dealing with the events that fulfill the seals. Uh, now let's go to the bottom of the page. In Desire of Ages 833 to 835, which is the last chapter of Desire of Ages, Ellen White explains the introductory vision to the seals. That's Revelation 4 and 5. Uh, we uh, dedicated a significant amount of time to study the introductory vision. In other words, Jesus ascending to heaven and being installed as the high priest and sitting on the throne as the king of the kingdom of grace. Uh, and then this applies to Christ's inauguration as, as priest upon his ascension. This means that uh, the introductory vision gives us the crucial historical starting point for the seals. Are you with me or not? So this gives us the beginning point. The last chapter of Desire of Ages is Ellen White's commentary on the introductory vision right before the first seal, which is the white horse. Then in the Great Controversy, page 641, Ellen White places the seventh seal in the context of the second coming. Now she doesn't quote Revelation 8 verse 1, but um, we're going to go through a method where we can determine uh, where Ellen White is commenting on Bible passages, even though she doesn't particularly mention the verses. Uh, so we have the starting point, which is the introductory vision, last chapter of Desire of Ages, and then you have the seventh seal uh, in Great Controversy, page 641. 
So where would you expect to find the fulfillment of the other seals, seal number one through seal number six? It must be between the last chapter of Desire of Ages and Great Controversy, page 641. Are you with me or not? As we shall see, several times Ellen White applies the expression of the first seal, conquering and to conquer, to the gospel conquests of the early church. By the way, uh, we're going to notice something very interesting in a moment. So the first seal would be the apostolic church, going out, conquering and to conquer. Uh, with regard to the second seal, Ellen White has a clear statement on the meaning of the sword. The second uh, writer has a sword in his hand that takes away peace from the earth. Ellen White has a significant statement on when that is fulfilled. Uh, and then she applies it to the persecutions of the early church, uh, the persecutions that they suffered at the hands of the Roman Empire. Concerning the third seal, Ellen White has a clear statement about the oil and the wine, uh, because oil and wine are mentioned in the third seal. Furthermore, we shall see in the course of our study that Ellen White has several clear statements about the fifth and sixth seals later on in the book Great Controversy, I might say. Regarding the seventh seal, she does not quote Revelation 8 verse 1, but clearly alludes to it. Now the, the next paragraph is extremely important. The best commentary on the introductory vision to the seals is the last chapter of the Desire of Ages. The title is, To My Father and Your Father, He's speaking to the disciples. The first two chapters of the book Acts of the Apostles explain the enthronement of Jesus in heaven on the day of Pentecost. So we have to link uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's when the seven spirits are sent to the earth that we studied about. And then Ellen White in the book The Great Controversy, expounds upon the seven seals in their proper order, culminating on page 641 with the seventh seal. So the last chapter of Desire of Ages actually has the introductory vision, Revelation 4 and 5. The book Acts of the Apostles has the enthronement of Christ when He arrives in heaven, and a description of the first seal, the conquest of the early church, and then the book Great Controversy has the comments on the second seal through the seventh seal, culminating in Great Controversy, page 641. Are you with me or not? So what is the best commentary on the seals? If I asked you, what is the best commentary that has ever been written on the seals? The last chapter of Desire of Ages, <laughs> the book Acts of the Apostles, and the book Great Controversy. And somebody asked yesterday about uh, what would be a good commentary on the book of Revelation. Well, I gave you the non-inspired commentaries, but the best commentary in Revelation is uh, the book Great Controversy. I don't know whether you've noticed, Ellen White follows the exact order of the book, uh, of, the book of Revelation from beginning to end. She begins with the persecutions in the, in the early centuries, and then she moves on to speak about the papacy. Then she speaks about the Millerites, 1844. And she's, before that, she speaks about the French Revolution. That's Revelation 11. Then she speaks about the three angels' messages. Then she deals with the final controversy. Then she deals with the second coming. Then she deals with what happens during the millennium. And then the desolation of the earth. And then what happens after the millennium. She's following the exact order of the book, Greek, uh, of, the book of Revelation. It's the best commentary on, on the book of Revelation is the book Great Controversy. Amen. So, uh, but, but, the, but the problem is Ellen White many times does not quote the verses that she's commenting on. We had an example of that in the introductory vision. You know, you read Revelation 4 and 5, it says that there in the throne room are the 24 elders and the four living creatures that have four faces and so on. And you have the seven spirits and you have one sitting on the throne who is not identified. And then you have a lamb as though it had been slain. You have all of these symbols. But Ellen White in her explanation, she says, the father is on the throne. She's interpreting who, who the person is. The father is on the throne. She says, there are cherubim and seraphim, the four living creatures. She doesn't say four living creatures. She never quotes the verses. 
Then she says, and there also present are the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. That would be the 24 elders. And then uh, in Acts of the Apostles, she speaks about the sending of the Holy Spirit to the earth on the day of Pentecost. But you would never know that she's commenting on Revelation chapter 4 by reading uh, what, what she's written because she doesn't quote Revelation 4. However, there is a hint. At the end of, uh, at the, end of the chapter, uh, the last chapter of Desire of Ages, she quotes Revelation chapter 5 verses 12 and 13. So if she's commenting at the very end of the chapter, Revelation 5, 12, and 13, where would you expect to find her commentary on Revelation 4? In the previous pages, right? So, so we have to be good detectives. We have to look for clues. You know, not everything is there on the surface. We have to think. We have to, we have to look at the structure, what comes before, what comes after, what order things are in. Let me, let me give you one other example of uh, how, uh, you know, we need to uh, look and read at Ellen White um, when many times she doesn't quote verses specifically, although she's commenting on what the verses are saying. And this is not directly related to the seals, but it's another illustration of how we need to read the great controversy. Ellen White, in the, in the chapter on the time of trouble, she comments on the 144,000. And she comments on the first four plagues of uh, Revelation chapter 16. So in the chapter of the time of trouble, she comments on the first four plagues. Very brief, less than one page, she comments on the first four plagues. But uh, we don't find any verse where she comments on the fifth plague or the sixth plague, the drying up of the Euphrates. And so you say, well, Ellen White, you know, she had, a lot, she had something to say about the first four, but she had nothing to say about plagues number five and six. She did, but she doesn't quote the verses. Now, let, let's notice this. I know you don't have a copy of the Great Controversy, but um, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you how important it is to, to just, um, you know, try to read between the lines what verses Ellen White is commenting on, even though she does not quote the verses specifically. I'm going to the chapter, God's People Delivered. It's uh, the first page of God's People Delivered. It's Great Controversy, page 635. In the previous chapter, she's commented on the first four plagues, you know, and, uh, and then after that, uh, she doesn't quote about the fifth or sixth plagues. But what is the fifth plague? It's a plague of darkness. What is the sixth plague? It's the drying up of the river Euphrates. And the seventh plague is a voice in heaven that causes the earthquake and lightning and thunder and so on. So notice great controversy, page 635. I'm only going to read at the bottom of the page. With shouts of triumph, jeering, and imprecation, throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. What is it that rushes? Water rushes. What does the waters represent? What do they represent? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples that are inimical to the people of God. So they're about to rush upon their prey, when lo, a dense blackness, deeper than the darkness of the night, falls upon the earth. Plague number five, the darkness. Doesn't quote the verse, but she speaks of the darkness. Then, she, she, after she says uh, that a deep darkness, uh, deeper than the darkness of the night, falls upon the earth, then a rainbow shining with the glory from the throne of God spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. Now listen to this. The angry multitudes are suddenly arrested. What happens with the rushing waters? They're arrested. What is that? The drying up of the Euphrates. Are you following me or not? But she doesn't quote the verses. So you say she doesn't have anything to say. Yes, she does. So that's how we have to read Great Controversy, 
Acts of the Apostles, we have to look where Ellen White is commenting on Bible verses even though she doesn't quote them. And then I want you to notice that, uh, and, and this is where I got this clue, the, the multitudes are suddenly arrested, mocking cries die away, the objects of their murderous rage are forgotten. With uh, fearful forebodings they gaze, they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness. And then here's the clue that, that, that I saw that helped me understand that, that the arresting of the multitudes is the drying up of the waters, and the darkness deeper than the darkness of midnight is the fifth plague. At the end of, of uh, page 636, Ellen White quotes the seventh plague. <laughs> uh, let me just read that. Um, the streams cease to flow, dark heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory. Whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters saying, It is done! Revelation 16, 17. Seventh plague. And then she says, That voice shakes the heavens and the earth. There is a mighty earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Verses 17 and 18 of the seventh plague. And then she goes on a little bit further down to speak about the hailstones and the weight of the hailstones, about the weight of a talent. Verses 19 and 21. So she's commenting on the seventh plague. So where would you expect to find her commentary on the fifth and sixth? <laughs> So in the, in the chapter of the time of trouble, she's commenting uh, on the four, first four plagues. Then, the darkness deeper than the darkness of the night, doesn't quote the verses. Then, the multitudes that want to rush upon God's people are arrested. That's the drying up of the Euphrates. And then she quotes the verses having to do with the seventh plague. Are you following the, the method? But for this, you know, we, we have to dedicate time. And we, we have to, uh, you know, look at the sequence of things. Uh, not only just look at what we're reading at any given moment, we need to look at what comes before, what comes after the specific context in which uh, passages or verses are found. Now, with that in mind, let's go to um, page 121, and we're going to notice here a summary of the introductory vision and the seven seals. A summary of the introductory vision and of the seven seals. Now the first paragraph, we don't have time to do this, but there's a striking parallel between Matthew 24 and the seven seals. You'll find many, many parallels. The sequence is, is basically the same sequence as the seals. Um, the seals are parallel in many ways to Matthew 24. This indicates that the seal dis seals describe in symbolic language events that occur during the Christian era because the events in Matthew 24 are in chronological order. Uh, we don't have time to get into that, but I, I did a series on Matthew 24. It's the most popular series that Secrets Unsealed has. Uh, and uh, it was 14 presentations studying the, the whole of Matthew 24 as well as the parallel passages in Mark 13 and Luke 21. Uh, you, you, can, um, you, know, you can download that for free or you can get a hard copy here if you wish. But we don't have time to do the Matthew 24 parallel with the seals as well. We just don't have enough sessions. Uh, the seven churches, the next paragraph, the seven churches are a description of the internal condition of the church from apostolic times till the second coming. Even though the seals cover the same historical period as the churches, the emphasis is different. In other words, the time period is the same, but the emphasis is different between the churches and the seals. While, the churches, while in the churches, the emphasis falls upon the internal condition of, of the church in different periods of history, the seals describe the external forces that affect the church during the same periods. Now let's look at the chronological flow then of the seals. And uh, let me just ask you this question. This is the quiz question for today. How many times in great controversy does Ellen White mention the barbarian invasions? <laughs> Once, or 
this much. So why do we have four trumpets for the barbarian invasions? If they are so significant. We begin, you know, we're going to study the trumpets next year, Lord willing. If we're still here, if the time of trouble hasn't come. <laughs> and things are moving very fast. Uh, but, but, you know, Ellen White does not see any significance to Islam in the end time. She has the one comment on 1840. Yes, in Great Controversy. But that's, the, that's practically the lone statement that Ellen White has on the Muslims. Interesting. You know, they called it the Turk back then. So anyway, that's just a, that's just a little sidelight. Let's look at the sequence. First, the Father sits alone on His throne in the holy place of the heavenly throne room. That's Revelation 4, right? Yeah? Then the cloud catches Jesus up to the Father's throne in the holy place. And you have Acts 1, 9 through 11, Desire of Ages 8, 30 to 8, 33, Acts of the Apostles 30 to 34. Then the Father anoints the war hero as priest and king in the holy place. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost announces this heavenly event on earth. Correct? The seven spirits are what? They're there in chapter 4, and in chapter 5 they're sent to the earth. And then we have the seals, the breaking of the seals after that. The breaking of the seals, in other words, describe events that transpire between the moment that Jesus began His work in the holy place and when finally He opens the scroll to reveal who will inherit what Adam lost. Does that make sense? The seven seals are simply the span between the inauguration and the consummation, the events in between. That's historicism. If Adventists ever get rid of historicism, we have no reason to exist. Because our origins are based on a historicist understanding, for example, of Revelation 10. So if we discard the method, we discard the message. Because the message is based on the method. And there are many scholars these days that are questioning the historicist method of interpreting prophecy. Notable scholars. It's dangerous ground to get rid of the method because if you, get, you have the wrong method, <laughs> you're going to reach the wrong conclusions. Now the first seal, this is just so you can get an overview of what we're going to study. The first seal describes the conquests of the apostolic church. And that's found in Acts of the Apostles, page 47 to page 602. The second seal, the red horse, is a description of the persecutions against Christians by the Roman emperors, the early Roman emperors of, uh, the, of the Christian age. By persecution, Satan attempts to eradicate God's faithful people. So Satan's first method, the red horse, red is a, a symbolic of blood. Satan tries to get rid of the church by persecution. The third seal is a black horse. Satan changes his strategy from persecution to infiltration. His philosophy was this, if you cannot fight them, join them. Christianity merges with paganism, and the darkness of apostasy enters the church during the period of Constantine. Great controversy, 49 through 60. <laughs> the Ellen White's following the order. The fourth seal. The pale horse, it's, a, it's a, the horse of death. The famine of the third horse is going to lead to death in the fourth horse. The apostasy in the church intensifies under the fourth horse and leads to the emergence of papal Rome, who persecutes and kills God's people for 1260 years. In other words, there's lots of martyrs during that period. So then we come to the fifth seal. Are you seeing that there's a sequence here? These are not just separate, disconnected events. The conquest of the early church leads Satan to say, I've got, I've got to get rid of this through persecution. But when he persecutes, the church grows all the more. So he says, I've got to change my method. So you have the black horse. 
he infiltrates the church with apostasy. And then the papacy becomes a persecutor and kills the martyrs. So under the fifth seal, the martyrs are crying out and saying, hey, we're, we're on the right side and the papacy's on the wrong side and we're being killed. And they're crying out from under the altar. Are you with me or not? Those whom pagan and papal Rome slew cry out for justice. By the way, the judgment of Daniel 7, the purpose of the judgment of Daniel 7 is, is to reverse the, earthly the unjust earthly judgments. You know, there's this, this big debate about Daniel chapter 7. We use it to, to speak about the investigative judgment of all of those who profess Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, Desmond Ford, who passed away recently, says, well, the central theme of Daniel 7 is, is not upon God's people, it's upon the punishment of the little horn. But when you read the chapter carefully, the little horn, the, it says in Daniel 7, prospered. Things went well. The saints were given into his hand for 1260 years, time, times, and the dividing of time. So in other words, the papacy prevailed and the saints lost. Was that just? No. Earthly courts condemned God's people. So what does God do in the investigative judgment? What He does is He revokes the judgments of the earthly courts and He rewards the saints of the Most High. So the central theme is not the punishment of the little horn for persecuting the saints, it's vindicating the saints who were persecuted by the papacy. And that's clear, because Jesus goes before the Father, before the Ancient of Days, clearly it says in Daniel 7, Jesus goes to receive the kingdom. And then the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High and to Jesus. So those who were persecuted and killed, now the heavenly judgment reverses the judgments, the unjust judgments on earth, and rewards the saints of the Most High. So the central theme of Daniel 7 is not the, the punishment of the little horn. The central theme is the rewarding of God's people that have been mistreated by the little horn. Are you following me or not? Now, uh, let's continue here then the fifth seal. Those whom pagan and papal Rome slew cry out for justice. And I have in parentheses, the judgment in Daniel 7 reverses the sentences in the earthly tribunals. In answer to their pleas, what does God do? when uh, the uh, martyrs under the altar are crying out. What does God do? He gives them a white robe. Well, they're dead. <laughs> it means that they're saved, right? Because they have the righteousness of Christ. And what does He tell them? He says, rest a little while until the rest of the martyrs are killed. And then you'll be rewarded with the rest of the martyrs. Does this give us the idea that the same power that persecuted in the past is going to persecute again in the future? Hmm. The sixth seal. Signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the great earthquake. The sixth seal has two parts, we're going to notice. And the two parts are separated by a long period of time. The first part of the sixth seal is Revelation 6, 12, and 13. And the significant thing is, you know, Ellen White, this is so interesting. Ellen White quotes Revelation 6, 12, and 13. Uh, and then 200 pages later in Great Controversy, she quotes Revelation 6, 14 to 17. Why would she do that? Because there's a time gap. There's all sorts of events that transpire between the first part of the sixth seal and the last part of the sixth seal. The last part of the sixth seal is the second coming of Christ. So let's go through this. The fulfillment of the first part of the sixth seal, Revelation 6, 12, and 13, occurs between 1755 and 1833. The second part of the sixth seal... Revelation 6, 14 to 17, will occur at the second coming. And then in between that, you have Revelation 7, 1 through 8. It describes the period between the first and the second part of the sixth seal, the sealing. And then, of course, you have the seventh seal, which is silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I don't believe that we apply the year-day principle there. 
because after the second, at the, after the close of probation, the time periods are to be understood literally, not, and we'll come back to that later. So in, under the seventh seal, there is a period of awful silence during the second coming of Christ. When the redeemed cry out, who shall be able to stand? Ellen White says that, that uh, when Jesus is coming, he hasn't arrived at the earth yet. Uh, the saints cry out, who shall be able to stand? That's the last part of the sixth seal, right? And then Ellen White says that there's an awful period of silence in heaven. And then after that awful period of silence, which is the seventh seal, a voice is heard saying, my grace is sufficient for you. That is the seventh seal. And we're going we're to study all of these things. I just want, to get, want you to get the overview now. And finally, the last paragraph, when the seventh seal is broken, God will take His people to heaven for how long? For a thousand years. They will be able to do what? To examine the contents of the scroll. What does the scroll contain? We studied this. What does the scroll contain? The whole history of the world. And the decisions that each person made within the history of the world that determines their salvation or their perdition. Remember the case of the, uh, of the uh, religious leaders that said, uh, Read it unto us, Barabbas? Ellen White says that their act was written in the book. Uh, is, are they going to see that event and why they're lost? Yes. So the book reveals why people were saved and why people were lost. Let me ask you, after the millennium, is there going to be a great panoramic view where the wicked are going to see why they were lost? That's the final uns unfurling of the scroll. It's after the millennium. But God's people will examine the contents during the millennium. Are you with me or not? After the millennium, God will open the scroll and reveal its contents to the lost who are outside the holy city, and then God will create a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So that basically is uh, an overview of the seals. Is that clear? Yes. Sequence clear? Okay, now we're going to uh, study specifically the events uh, in more detail. So let's go to page 139. We've got about 25 minutes. I don't know if we'll be able to finish the first seal, but we'll give it a shot. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. That's page 139 in the syllabus. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse that's the reason why uh, um, Steve Wahlberg called his ministry White Horse Media. I like that name. Isn't that a nice name for a ministry? So it says, uh, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out, conquering and to conquer. Now, there are several symbols in these verses. First, there is a white horse. Secondly, there is a rider on the white horse. Third, the rider has a crown on his head. Fourth, he has a bow in his hand. If he's going to conquer, uh, you know, the bow uh, definitely is an item of war of that time. And with the crown and the bow, he goes out conquering and to conquer. So, let's notice, first of all, what is meant by the white horse and its rider. How do we determine what is meant by the white horse and the rider? Do, does Revelation 6, uh, 1 and 2 explain what the horse and the rider are? No. So, so how can we ever decipher it? <laughs> we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And you say, why do we do that? Let me ask you, who inspired Scripture? The Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit put everything in Scripture that we need to understand Scripture? Yes. Or did, did, did He miss something where, where we can't explain something because He forgot to put something in there that explains what we're reading? No. The Holy Spirit placed in Scripture everything we need to understand Scripture. 
So when you find a symbol that is not explained, you go to other places in the Bible that explain the symbol. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. And there are people in the Adventist church, scholars today, that are questioning the, uh, the, the principle of sola scriptura or the principle of uh, scripture, its own interpreter. They say, well, you know, uh, you have to stay within the passage itself. You know, this is the proof text method. So what they do is, is, is they, they speak negatively of this method of allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture because they say that's the proof. You, you find all these verses as proof texts. Well, maybe they are proof texts. They prove that we're right, huh? <laughs> now notice Zechariah chapter 10 verses 3 to 6. The, uh, Zechariah is a very prophetic book with lots of symbols. It's one of the most difficult bi uh, books to understand in the whole Bible, Zechariah. But you'll notice in Zechariah 10 verses 3 through 6 that um, God's people, Judah, are compared to a conquering horse. And I'm going to read the verses. God is speaking. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. <laughs> so what does the horse represent in this passage? Judah. And uh, who is riding the horse? The Lord is riding the horse. So once again it says, and will make them, that is Judah, as his royal horse in the battle. So is there going to be conquering and to conquer? Absolutely. From him comes the cornerstone. From him the tent peg. From him the battle what? Bow. Is there a bow in the first, uh, first seal? Yes. So it says, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. Ruler, interesting. Does the rider have a crown? Yes. They shall be like what? Like mighty men who tread down their enemies. Is this a conquering horse? Oh, yes it is. And it goes on to say, they shall tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them. Ah, oh, who's riding the horse? Uh, his people are the horse. Let me ask you, who guides, does the horse guide the rider or the rider guide the horse? <laughs> Well, sometimes the horse does. It's the rebellious horse. <laughs> but normally it would be the rider that guides the horse. So, so notice, once again it says, They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. I will strengthen the house of Judah. See, the horse represents God's people. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. Now notice what Ellen White has to say where she explains what the horse represents. He, this is Reverend Herald, July 10, 1900, God desired His people to go forth, conquering and to conquer. So what does the horse represent? His people. In another statement, Prophets and Kings 725, uh, and this is speaking about the final uh, conquering uh, when the loud cry is proclaimed. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. She, that is the church, is to go forth into all the world, doing what? Conquering and to conquer. So what does the white horse represent? It represents the church, defeating the enemies of the church, conquering and to conquer. Ellen White also described Jesus as the rider on the white horse. It is the rider who guides the horse, not the horse that guides the rider. That is, the rider of the horse symbolizes Jesus, and the horse itself represents His people. 
Notice volume 4 of the Bible Commentary, page 1146. The issue of the battle does not rest upon the strength of mortal man. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. In the power of him who rides forth, conquering and to conquer, weak, finite man may gain the victory. Amen. So who is the rider? The rider is Jesus. And who is the horse? The ah, the horse is the church. Culperter Ministry, page 155. God's workers must gain a far deeper experience. If they will surrender all to Him, He will work mightily for them. They will plant the standard of truth upon fortresses till, uh, till then held by Satan, and with shouts of victory take possession of them. They bear the scars of battle, but there comes to them the comforting message that the Lord will what? Will lead them, see the horse, will lead them on conquering and to conquer. And then you have Christian Service, page 166. Christ identifies His interests with the interests of His faithful people. He suffers in the person of His saints, and whoever touches His chosen ones touches Him. In other words, there's a close intimate relationship between the rider and the horse. You know, just not anybody can ride a horse. There's a, there's a rapport between the horse and the rider. Notice in Heavenly Places, page 313, the world today is in crying need of a revelation of Christ Jesus. How? In the person of His saints. God desires that His people shall stand before the world. What kind of what? A holy people. What color is the horse? What does white represent? We'll come back to this in a moment. So once again, God desires that His people shall stand before the world a holy people. Why? Because there is a world to be saved by the light. By the way, light is white, right? We studied that yesterday. Of the gospel truth. And as the message of truth, that is to call men out of darkness into God's marvel at light, is given by the church, the lives of its members sanctified the spirit of truth, are to bear witness to the verity of the messages proclaimed. So we've interpreted what the rider represents and what the horse represents. The horse represents the church, and the rider that guides the horse is Jesus Christ, going out, conquering, and to conquer. Bottom of page 141. Scripture uses different symbols to illustrate the intimate relationship between Jesus and His people. Whoever touches His people, touches whom? Touches the Lord. And, um, you know, I have illustrations here. Uh, whoever touches the head, touches what? Touches the body, touches the head, right? For example, when somebody pricks you with a needle, does the head feel it? Yeah, it's the head that feels it, by the way, folks. <laughs> you say, oh, my, my hand felt it. Yeah, but it's being processed by the brain. So whoever hurts the body of Christ, hurts Christ. Whoever messes with the shepherd, or with the sheep, is messing with whom? With the shepherd. Whoever messes with the bride, is messes with the husband, is messing with the husband. And Jesus, as the sovereign commander, whoever messes with his armies, is messing with the commander. Revelation 19 describes the time when the church militant will become the church triumphant. When the spiritual victories of Christ through the church during the Christian dispensation become the literal victory of Jesus and His church at the second coming. Because at the end of the book we find the white horse again and the rider on the horse. Revelation 19, 11, and 12 describes that. And now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. 
And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. In his eyes, his eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. So at this point, the church militant, the church that is described in the first seal, now is the church victorious. Because Jesus is coming on a white horse with the armies of heaven to deliver his people from literal death at the hands of their enemies. Now let's talk about the color white. The horse is white. Futurists and dispensationalists believe that the white horse symbolizes a future antichrist that will pass himself off as Christ. They say, see, he's going to pass himself out as white, but he's really the antichrist. Uh, the problem with this is it doesn't fit with the book of Revelation. I have this quotation from George Eldon Ladd, uh, who was a scholar, a very, very good scholar, not an Adventist, but he wrote about the color white in Revelation. And I read, it's from, um, yeah, it's from a book that he wrote. Um, I didn't provide the reference here, but uh, I can get that for you. In the Revelation, white is always a symbol of Christ or of something associated with Christ or of spiritual victory, like the great multitude who are clothed in white robes. Thus the exalted Christ has white hair, white as wool. The faithful will receive a white stone with a new name written on it. They are to wear white garments. The twenty-four elders are clad in white. The martyrs are given white robes, as is the great numberless throng. The Son of Man is seen on a white cloud. He returns on a white horse, accompanied by the armies of heaven, who are clad in white and ride white horses. In the final judgment, God is seated on a great white throne. So how can you say that the white horse of the first seal represents the Antichrist? In Revelation, the color white is always identified with Christ and with the followers of Christ. Now why white? Why is the horse white? The horse represents the church. Why would the horse be white? Because in Scripture, white represents what? Purity. Represents purity. And uh, you have several verses here uh, that we're not going to read. Uh, was the apostolic church a pure church in doctrine and lifestyle? We're going to read in a moment a, a quotation from Ellen White. Yes, it was a pure church in doctrine and in lifestyle. Now here comes another important point. However, white is also the color of what? It's the color of light. And light symbolizes what? The Word of God. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And light is white. So, so white would also represent the witness of the church through the Word. So white is also the color of light, and light symbolizes the Word of God. And you can look up the verses. During the white horse period, the church is pure, and it is the what? The light of the world. Are you following the argument? It's the light of the world. In obedience to the writer's command, the earliest church, that is the horse, witnessed where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost ends of the earth. The church won victory after victory, and the gospel went to the entire Roman Empire in a single generation. Was the apostolic church a conquering church? Was it a pure church? It was certainly a pure church. Did it shed light, which is the Word of God? Absolutely. Did it take away subjects from Satan's kingdoms? By the thousands. Now the white horse stands in contrast to the black horse of darkness. We're going to see that, that black and darkness are used synonymously. In other words, the black horse is the horse of darkness. When darkness comes into the church, when the church loses its purity of doctrine and lifestyle, it becomes what? It becomes a black horse. 
Now Ellen White describes the early church. The early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. So do you have a fight going on here? Oh yeah, you have a, you have a real struggle. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. So it wasn't only doctrines, it was a lifestyle. Therefore they were hated by the wicked, even as the ungodly Cain hated Abel. For the same reason that Cain slew Abel did those who sought to throw off the restraint of the Holy Spirit put to death God's people. It was for the same reason that the Jews rejected and crucified the Savior, because the what? The purity and holiness of His character, see that's the color white, because the purity and holiness of His character was a constant rebuke to their selfishness and corruption. From the days of Christ until now His faithful disciples have excited the hatred and opposition of those who love and follow the ways of sin. So do you see the number of times Ellen White in this statement emphasizes the purity of the early church, of their lifestyle, of their doctrine, the fact that they witnessed? See, this is all related to the symbols in the first horse. Now what does the bow represent? Well, in ancient times, what weapons were used? Well, they used the sword, but they also used what? The bow. 2 Kings 13 verse 17 shows us that the bow represents uh, God's deliverance in battle, the bow and arrows. Uh, in Acts of the Apostles, page 45, you find the commentary of Ellen White on the bow. The arguments of the apostles alone, though clear and convincing, would not have removed the prejudice that had withstood so much evidence. However, the Holy Spirit sent the arguments home to hearts with divine power. The words of the apostles, and I have in brackets here, now that the seven spirits had been sent into all the earth, the apostles shoot the arrows and the spirit through the ministration of the angels guides them to the heart. So the words of the apostles were as what? Sharp arrows of the Almighty convicting men of their terrible guilt in rejecting and crucifying the Lord of glory. So the church is going out to conquer with a bow. And what, what do the arrows represent? They represent the Holy Spirit guiding the arrows to the heart to bring about conversions. Desire of Ages, page 104. God does not send messengers to flatter the sinner. He delivers no message of peace to lull the unsanctified into fatal security. He lays heavy burdens upon them, the conscience of the wrongdoer, and pierces the soul with arrows of conviction. Gospel Workers 150 and 151, the words of Christ were as what? Sharp arrows. The, uh, did, the, did the apostles shoot arrows? Oh yeah, they shot arrows, symbolically. And uh, who directed the arrows to the heart? Uh, the Holy Spirit. The, the seven spirits that were sent to the earth. So the words of Christ were as sharp arrows, which went to the mark and wounded the hearts of His hearers. Every time He addressed the people, whether His audience was large or small, His words took saving effect upon the soul of someone. And then comes this beautiful statement, Christ's Object Lessons 158. The Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in a self-righteous armor which the arrows of God barbed and true aimed, aimed by angel hands failed to penetrate. So are you catching the picture about what the first seal is all about? Ah, the church is going out conquering, conquering and to conquer. Jesus is guiding the church. You know, there's the, the, the arrows are being shot. Souls are being converted. So let's take a look at the crown, because the writer has a crown. The word for crown here is Stephanos. With few exceptions, like we noticed yesterday, the Stephanos crown is the one that is given to a victor. 
For example, it was given to victors in the Olympic Games in the times of the Roman Empire. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, we're going to read several verses now, uh, probably some of them we'll have to read in the next session, uh, but uh, we're going to see that the crown involves a struggle, a fighting, going out conquering and to conquer, and getting a crown because victory is being gained. Revelation 2 verse 10, which we're going to take a look at uh, later, do not fear any of these things, those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, see, once again, faithfulness in the battle, and what? And I will give you the crown of life. James 1 verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. See, once again, there's the trial, the battle. For when he has approved, has been approved, he will receive what? The crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. 2 Timothy 4, 7-8, through 8, had the Apostle Paul gained the victory? Oh yeah, he's about to be beheaded, and he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. And then you have this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 to 27, where the Apostle Paul uh, uses the example of the uh, Olympic Games. Do you not know that those who run in a race, uh, in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for a what? an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So what does a, what does a crown represent? It represents victory in battle. It represents victory in trials. Is that true of the apostolic church? Did they gain victory after victory? Yes. Now in our next class, we're going to finish uh, our study of the first horse, and then we're going to get into the second horse. We're going to look at the phrase, conquering and to conquer. We put all the symbols together. We have one thing that we need to still study. What does it mean that the early church went out conquering and to conquer? That will be the study for our next lesson.